tonight we have been given the letter to Philemon, um, and that's what we're going to study. Now, this letter is a bit of an unusual one. It's Paul's shortest epistle. It's only just over 300 words. And the interesting part is that Paul makes no theological argument in this letter. There is no big theological point. Paul doesn't even mention explicitly the work of Christ on the cross. This letter is the only, uh, is the only one that doesn't contain correction. Paul doesn't seek to correct Philemon at all in this letter. And so if Paul doesn't make a theological argument, and if he doesn't correct, why would it be in our Bibles? Why is this letter here? What's the point of this letter? Undoubtedly, I would expect Paul wrote lots of letters to lots of different people, many that weren't in our Bibles. So why is this one here? Why is it that God has put this letter in our Bibles? What is there to be gained in studying this little book of Philemon? Well, I want to suggest to you tonight that this little letter to Philemon is a window into what it looks like to live out a Christian life. I want to suggest to you that after all the big epistles and their weighty doctrine lies this small book of Philemon that shows a window into what it looks like, the joys of a simple Christian existence. This letter is often thought of as a gem by those who have studied it, a refreshing picture of what it is to live a life for God, to what it looks like to be saved by God, what it looks like to see others saved by God, a picture of love, of unity, forgiveness, and compassion. And as we look at these saints who lived for Christ long ago, it's not a letter of weighty doctrine, it's not a letter of stern warning, it's not a letter of stinging rebuke, it's a picture of these simple blessings of love and the Christian life. All the big epistles tell us of how we are to live, and this one shows us what it is to live that way. So then we're going to look at this book in three headings. First of all, we're going to look at verses 1 to 7, and we're going to see a report of refreshment. The first place we see this Christian life lived out is in verses 1 to 7. In these verses, Paul encourages Philemon about all the ways he is living well according to the faith he has in Christ. We know from the book of Colossians that Philemon lives in Colossae and that he's a good friend of Paul. There weren't many who were recorded as being Paul's beloved fellow servants. That was quite a title to hold. Look at verse 4. In another translation, verse 4 would read as saying, Every time your name comes up in my prayers, Philemon, I say, oh, thank you, God. Philemon was a faithful servant, a loving brother. Paul had many reasons to be thankful for him. He was a man who had great love and faith in Jesus Christ. He was a man who loved and cared for all the saints, who, was, who always sought to do more, to give more, and to love more, who was a joy to be around. He was the guy whose dinner table was always crowded, who was happy to give up his time at the weekends if a brother needed help. He was the guy who was always on his knees praying that saints would be edified, who would give freely both money and time. He would be the first to put his arm around the brokenhearted. He would be one who leads in love. Verse 7, Paul has this to say, I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. You see, Philemon would pour into the lives of others to refresh and to restore. Now, a couple of years ago at Cornhill, Alistair Begg used an illustration, a visual aid that helped with this, and it worked, so I'm going to steal it. He, had, he brought up two sweets, which I think I have. The first was a pack of Smarties, and he had this to say, this is what the church does not need. Smarties, not talking about academics, talking about being a smart aleck, a show-off, a know-it-all. The one to whom God looks is the one who is humble and contrite in spirit, who trembles at the word of God. When we read the history of the church, the most useful people in the church were the people like J.C. Ryle, who had a vast grasp of theology, a deep knowledge of the gospel, but they were those 
who were not smarties, but they were in fact refreshers, like our brother Philemon. Take your pick. Oh, he's so smart. Everybody thought he was so smart, but we barely knew what he was talking about. He thinks he's so smart. Or he refreshed my heart. I was surprised by it, but it helped me greatly. Philemon was not a smarty. He was a refresher. He had such love for the saints that they would find their hearts refreshed. So much so that when Paul wrote to him, he was able to say in verse 7, Philemon, seeing your love and the way you comfort people, the way you refresh hearts, it brings me joy. When I think of you, I just have to pray, oh, thank you, God. Now, I just want to linger here for just a second. What a thing to be striving for. What a thing to be someone who seeks to refresh the souls of the saints. It is my prayer that we can all grow in this, showing our love and concern for one another in such a way that by being together, we might have our souls refreshed by one another. We are not called to be smarties. The church does not need smarties. The church needs refreshers, people who, like in verse 5, receive all the saints out of the same love they would have for Christ. It would certainly bring me joy if I was to hear someone come up to me on Sunday and say, I was chatting with such and such the other day, and he just, he refreshed my heart. I was invited over by such and such. We spent an afternoon together, and they refreshed my heart. We've had seminars these past weeks on both depression and anxiety, struggles that many face. What a thing it would be if we were to have a brother or sister who would stand alongside us and refresh our hearts. Look back at verse 2. In verse 2, we get two other names mentioned. First of all, Aphia, who most likely was Philemon's wife, and Archippus, was probably his son. We know from the book of Colossians that Archippus had a ministry to fulfill. He was likely involved in the teaching and the preaching within the church in Colossae. The church, which we find out in verse 2, meets in Philemon's house. And remember, we know from the book of Acts that the church wasn't something that gathered on a Sunday. We hear that they often were in the business of meeting daily together. And so we get this picture of Philemon, the refresher, the loving and affectionate brother, who along with his wife and son, hosts the church in their homes. His wife, diligent, loving and gentle, seeking to serve and care for the saints. And their son too, involved in teaching and preaching as they as a family, as a church, live out their faith, loving God and loving others. That's the first Section and that's what it aims to highlight. The first seven verses are designed uh, to encourage Philemon. They're not to soften him up so that in the, when Paul gives a request in the rest of the book, he feels a certain persuasion to do it. This is not Paul giving Philemon the puppy eyes that he would get his ideas together and give it a go, or trying to force him to live up to some sort of reputation. What Paul is doing here is he's highlighting all the ways in which Philemon is living faithfully, the ways he's living well, the ways he's showing love and faith, before going on to the next section where he gives Philemon another area where he can apply that faith and love which he has received. Paul makes this very clear. Look at verse 8. Paul says, Though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, Yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. Paul says, I could command you. It's well within my right. I am an apostle. But I would rather lay this, lay this out to you as an opportunity for you to show your love and faith. Paul could command, but he would rather that he would appeal to Timothy. That Timothy might not be obeying, but that he might be striving to show love out of his own motivations. And so even at Paul's request, he is in keeping, even so, and so, even Paul's request, he is in keeping with his personality, his relationship of loving encouragement 
seeking to lead people with the tools of encouragement and opportunity. Someone said to me this week, Paul was the early church apostolic enforcer. He was tough and rough, heavy-handed. But when we look at the letter to Philemon, we see that Paul was just an old man honoring Christ in this, even in his imprisonment, asking that Philemon would take hold of this opportunity to show faith and love. It is, oh, wrong way. (laughs) Our next title in his request is verses 8 to 16, which our title will be a requirement to reconcile, a requirement to reconcile. Now, Paul in verse 8 turns his main, to his main area of concern. This passage turns on that word accordingly. This word accordingly is basically saying, Philemon, since you have shown your desire to live in faith and in love in all these ways, may I point you now to another area in which you can show this same love and faith. And it's in verse 10 that we find out what that area is. Verse 10, Paul writes, I appeal to you, Philemon, for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become in my imprisonment. Paul's concern in this letter is for Onesimus, someone who he has come to love and care for. And his appeal to Philemon is, as we find in verse 17, that Philemon would receive Onesimus when he arrives in Colossae in the same way as if he were receiving Paul. That's the general shape of Paul's request in this letter. Philemon, when my child comes, my child Onesimus, please receive him. Receive him, look after him, welcome him, care for him in the same way as you have received me. When Paul says in verse 10, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, our first response is, who is Onesimus? But that would not have been Philemon's reaction Philemon's reaction would be one of shock, horror, as he would realize instantly who this Onesimus is that Paul is referring to. You see, there's a bit of a backstory here. If we look at verse 16, we see implied that Onesimus used to be Philemon's bondservant. He would have served in Philemon's house. He was not a stranger. He would have been part of the family in Colossae. But at some point during the time when Onesimus was serving in Philemon's house, something happened and Onesimus ran away. We see some of the evidence for this in our passage. Verse 15, Onesimus was parted from Philemon. Verse 18, Paul offers to repay anything that is owed to cover the cost of a runaway slave. And verse 12, Paul is now sending him back to Philemon. Onesimus did a runner. He may also have stolen from Philemon, we don't know. He might have stolen money or valuables to help finance his travels. Verse 18 would hint us at such. And then Onesimus made the long journey from Colossae to Rome, from what is modern day Turkey to Italy. Rome was a favorite place for slaves to go. It was a great place if you wanted to escape and remain hidden. It was a city of some 300 million people, and many, went, many slaves went there and were able to acquire influence and wealth. It seemed like a good option. But for Onesimus, with all his plans for his new life in Rome, things worked out rather differently. Of all the people that Onesimus could end up running into in the city of over 300 million, he managed to run into Paul the Apostle, who was under house arrest at that time. Now we have no idea how old Onesimus was. We haven't, had a, we haven't a clue why he ran. And most intriguing of all, we don't know how he came to bump into Paul. Maybe Onesimus was doing some maintenance at Paul's house. Maybe he happened to be de- delivering meals. Maybe he had heard about Paul and was seeking him out for some reason we don't know. But what we do know is that after finding Paul in Rome, Onesimus was brought to a saving faith, um, a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, by God's grace, was brought to repentance and faith, which is incredible. That's why Paul talks about Onesimus as his child in verse 10. 
whose father he had become. Paul was Onesimus' father in the faith, the one who had told him the gospel, who had explained how Christ had died to reconcile us to himself, how we could be freed from sin and find new life in Christ. It was Paul who had been used by God to bring Onesimus to faith, and so he felt a special responsibility. <laughs> Having been saved through faith, look at all the changes in Onesimus' life. He ran away and was alone in the world, but now he is adopted as a child in verse 10. He's gone from being just a slave to being more than a slave, being a beloved brother in verse 16. He was useless in verse 11, but now he is useful. The last one is a bit of a pun. His name literally translated means useful, yet he is declared to be useless. Onesimus couldn't measure up. He fell short of his namesake. He missed the mark. He was useless. But now having been brought to faith, made a recipient of the finished work of Christ, now he is declared to be useful. He is restored to what uh, he was meant to be, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this world, that meant a servant of Philemon. You see, this is why we get, this is why the great reformer Martin Luther said, we are all Onesimuses. This could be our testimony. Once slaves who ran away, who disregarded the goodness of our master and went seeking for a life of our own in this world dead in our trespasses and sins. But God, being rich in mercy, made us alive together with him in Christ. He restored us to be useful servants. He made us beloved brothers and sisters. He took us in and in our usefulness made us useful. So if you're truly saved, I'm sorry to break it to you, but you are useful. Paul says it here, Christ saved you that you might serve him. No excuses. We are declared to be useful servants of the Lord Jesus and are returned to him to serve him. Onesimus' story sounds an awful lot like the prodigal son, which is the same sort of thing. The story of a prodigal son who ran away, like the slave who ran away but has come home to his master. <laughs> So Onesimus is declared to be useful. He's declared to be a beloved brother. And now in verse 11, Paul says, I'm going to send him back to you, sending my very heart to you, Philemon. Paul is sending him back, but why? Paul obviously cares about him if, Philemon is, if Onesimus is his very heart. Why would he send him back? Well, our current heading is a requirement to reconcile that word required coming from verse 8. Reconciliation is what is required of all believers. Onesimus has become a believer, but he is still Philemon's runaway slave. This is an issue that must be addressed, that must be reconciled. Let me read to you Matthew 5.23 that may have been on Paul's mind. If you are offering your gift at the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go to your brother. First be reconciled to him, then come and offer your gift. We don't give gifts at altars, but the principle is the same. You could even bring in Romans 12 that we are to get, live our lives as living sacrifices. We give our whole lives on that altar, but we can't unless we have first been reconciled to one another. The gospel requires reconciliation. Paul would have known that. So when the opportunity came up to send Onesimus back, Paul would have done so. And here he is doing that very thing here. Part of Onesimus' repentance is to face up to the things that he has done wrong. The things he has done wrong before God, but also before man. He was wrong to run away. As difficult as it may be to reconcile that, he still needs to go out and seek right, to right that wrong as far as is possible. He needs to return to Philemon. Verse 
You see, a Christian cannot solely believe the gospel. That's not enough. We must determine to live it out, and in this passage, that means seeking reconciliation. We are saved by grace, but for a life lived for Christ. James says in James 1.23, do not merely listen to the words, and in so deceive yourself, but do what it says. The Christian must seek in all things to reconcile, to make peace, to right their wrongs. Onesimus is literally accompanying a letter to the Colossians that says in it, Christians are to submit wives to husbands, children to parents, and slaves to masters. As a Christian, he he cannot live in violation of this. He must seek to go out and reconcile, to go back and submit rightly as is honoring to God. How could he be a Christian and a runaway bondservant at the same time? He just can't. If he's a believer, he must go home and reconcile and submit to his master. That's why Paul in verse 14 wishes to do nothing without the consent of Philemon, because he recognizes that Philemon is his master. Now, Scripture makes clear in 1 Corinthians that if a slave can gain his freedom, he should, if it's legitimate to do so. To run away is a crime in the Roman world, but more importantly, it goes against God's command to submit to the authorities placed over us. Now, it's important to to remember that when we're talking about slavery here, we're not talking about the transatlantic slave trade. This was not the horrific and inhumane abduction and using of other human beings. In Philemon's time, to be a slave meant being part of a household. You would have your accommodation provided, your food provided. You would be well fed. Some slaves received a wage. Some owned property. Some started businesses. And many had families. Often slaves had better houses, food and clothes than a lot of the free people. Now, as in all this, as in all things, there were some slaves who drew the short straw, but this was not the same slavery as we often think of. As Paul mentioned already to the believers in the letter to Corinthians, if you're a slave, don't worry. It's fine to be a slave. But if there is a legal possibility to be free, take hold of that opportunity. This letter is not written to abolish slavery. The church's remit is to preach and teach the gospel, carrying it to the very ends of the earth. That's the remit, but as a bride product, freedom for slaves did come about. Christian values inevitably left no room for slavery, and in our country it is no more. You see, it would be right for Onesimus to desire to want to go back to Philemon, to serve rightly as a servant of Philemon, but more importantly as a servant of Christ, that for love's sake, for the glory of God, he might pursue reconciliation in serving and submitting to his master. Reconciliation with each other is important. You can't live your life as a living sacrifice until you have sought reconciliation. So brothers and sisters, the call is simply this. If anyone has anything against you, if anyone has, if anyone has wrong that you have done against them. Make it your mission to seek out reconciliation. Determine to honor Christ in this, the requirement to reconcile. Now, thirdly, our last point, a policy of peacemaking. Verse 17 to the end of the book. A policy of peacemaking. Look at the ways Paul seeks to make peace in this letter. He appeals to Philemon. He doesn't command, verse 8. He encourages Philemon and gives the opportunity to become more encouraging. He presents reconciliation as an opportunity to love another brother. But now look down at verse 17. Paul says to Philemon, because you are a loving and faithful servant, because Onesimus is now a beloved brother in Christ, verse 17, if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. Now verse 18, if he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, Charge that to my account. Paul is willing to pay back what has been stolen if it means that these two beloved brothers might 
be able to reconcile. Paul encourages, he gives opportunity, he appeals, and he is willing to pay the debt. This is huge. Paul, in his actions, is Christ-like. He is willing to step up, step in, and pay the price that the sins of another might be forgiven and he be reconciled to his master. The words of verse 18 could have been Christ's words in the story of the cross. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I'll pay it. And he's proper serious. Look at verse 19. Paul grabs the pen and writes this. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Paul is willing to show the same love to Onesimus that Christ has shown him. How many of us could do the same? How many of us would be willing to pay that price? Paul shouldn't have to pay, but he is willing for the sake of peace that brothers might be reconciled. That's the importance he places on it. Paul is willing to play the part of Christ that in his actions he might testify to the goodness of God and that peace might be brought about between brothers. Paul has a policy of peacemaking. But Paul just adds a little note to the end of this in verse 19. Now all this, verse 19, is to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. This is a subtle but major point. Paul points out that, to, that Philemon, Paul points out, points out to Philemon, how can you ask Onesimus for what he owes you? How can you ask him to pay back what he owes when you owe far more, when you owe even your whole life? Onesimus owns money, owes money, but you owe your life. It's most likely from, from what we piece, can piece together that Philemon heard the gospel from Paul in Ephesus while he was teaching there for two years. It was only a short journey from Colossae, and if it were not for Paul, then Philemon would still be dead in his trespasses and sins. The reason he is kept alive, the reason he has kept his life, is because his debts are forgiven through Christ's work on the cross. So having been forgiven much, having been forgiven all this, how can he turn to Onesimus in unforgiveness? and demand repayment. Remember the parable of the two servants. The king set out to collect debts. He went to one of his servants who owed him more than he could repay and demanded his money back. The servant pleaded and the master relented and forgave him. But this same servant then later went out to collect a much smaller debt, insignificant by comparison, from a fellow servant and when that servant could not repay, he flung he who, had been, uh, he who owed little into jail, having been forgiven much. When the master found out, he said, you wicked servant, I had mercy on you, yet you failed to have mercy on another. Then the master flung that first servant into prison. He who had been forgiven much until every penny had been paid. This is the story of Philemon and for us also. If God has forgiven you so much, how could you turn to a brother and demand payment? The parable warns us that to fail to forgive a brother would put our forgiveness before God in jeopardy. All this is on the table in that short comment in verse 19. Paul sets this out as an opportunity to love and to show faith, but make sure not to hide the fact that it is a requirement of God that Philemon would forgive. You see, how outrageous would it be if I were to say, I know that God has forgiven all your debts, you have become a child of God, but you still owe me. You are still a debtor in my eyes. It's a serious thing not to forgive him who God has forgiven. God is the perfect judge. He can forgive you, but sinful me, no, I could not. Cough up and repay. What an arrogant affront to God. Remember what it says in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. It's not always easy to forgive, 
You see some of the costs of forgiveness in this passage, but it's necessary. Reconciliation is required. Peacemaking is a policy. We are called to receive others with that same love that we show for Christ, despite what might need to be forgiven. You see, when Paul says in verse 21, I am confident of your obedience, it's not obedience to Paul that he's talking about. It's not Paul who he's to be obedient to. Paul, it's God. Paul makes it explicitly clear that he is not commanding anything, but it is God who requires reconciliation. The obedience in verse 21 could not be to Paul, it is to God. Brothers and sisters, if we are God's people, and if we are reconciled to God, we must be reconciled to one another for love's sake. Colossians 3 verse 11 says, there is, not, there is not Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. It doesn't matter who, it doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter what they owe, God has united all people to be reconciled to one another for love's sake. This is the Christian life lived out, the gospel seen in the day to day. Does your life look like this? Could Paul say about you in verse 21, I am confident in your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Refreshing hearts, regaining reconciliation, pursuing peace, all for the sake of love. Receive one another with the love and faith that you would Christ. This letter doesn't tell us how the story ended, but I like to think that when Onesimus arrived back in Colossae, Philemon was waiting for him, like that father and the prodigal son with joyful thanksgiving for the fact that a beloved brother had come home. Onesimus, God's mister, useful, grafted into the family, serving the Lord Jesus alongside Philemon the refresher, his wife Aphia and their son Archippus, daily meeting with the church, living and serving with love and forgiveness for the glory of God and the refreshing of the saints. That's a short preview into what the letter of Philemon is about. The gospel lived out in full color. So may we go and do likewise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this letter. We thank you for the sharp and colorful picture it paints of what it is to live out our lives for Christ. We thank you, Lord, that while we were still sinners, wandering and useless, you stooped down and paid the ultimate price that we may receive new life and be restored as servants of Christ, useful and ready for every good work. Heavenly Father, may we serve you well. Lord, might we be those who are quick to forgive, who make reconciliation our top priority, who seek to give what we have, that there might be peace within your people. And Lord, may we be refreshers, those who live out our actions of love, that the hearts of the saints may be refreshed. To your glory, work in us, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.